Hi, welcome back to Outdoor Exploration. I'm Emily and this is our Friday home, little tiny homestead update. Um, first off, big one update. If you've been watching, you have uh, seen, I think last week, that big one, our favorite chick, the one who was bigger than all the rest of them and has been managing the flock until his illness, his or her, we don't know actually, um, uh, had an impacted crop. So um, in the beginning we thought he had a sour crop and he may have had a sour crop but then he got an impacted crop. The difference is sour crop is basically um, when the crop, I explained the anatomy of a chicken in the last video so I'll just leave that for now, but the crop um, in sour crop has a, a fermentation process happening. So it's kind of the same as a yeast infection in children. Uh, babies often get that and you know, adults with compromised immune systems and things like that. Chickens can get it too, but chickens can't burp. So they have gas forming in here that upsets their stomach. It just makes them ill. And we thought that's what he had in the beginning. The treatment for that is to try and regurgitate the chicken because they can't vomit themselves. Um, and to uh, give them probiotics and things like that. But those didn't help. And then we realized that his crop actually was getting bigger and very hard, which is how we knew it was impacted. So what was happening was he was eating his hay from the bedding, perhaps in an effort to heal his sour crop, we don't know. Um, and the treatment for that was to give him basically chicken smoothie, which was seeds and his regular mash uh, with some chicken vitamins and electrolyte solution. Um, blended up into a smoothie and strained so that uh, we could feed it to him by syringe and then massage his crop here um, so that it could get past and hopefully break up that hay and stuff. After a week of that he lost I think about half his body weight. He was pooping. We were getting things to go through but the crop wasn't getting smaller so nothing was breaking down and uh, would you care to put your leg back? It looks very uncomfortable. Okay, fine. Um, and uh, it wasn't improving and we knew he was gonna die of starvation. So upon receiving some advice from a friend, we decided to go with the surgery, which I think I mentioned last week we weren't going to do because that seems terrifying. Well, it is terrifying and we did it. And it wasn't nearly as terrifying once, when you have the adrenaline going and you're in there doing chicken surgery for the first time in your life, suddenly anything goes. Uh, so what we did was sterilized him and uh, I do have a photo we'll put in right here um, but we didn't videotape this because that's not that's not nice or respectful and it's too terrifying for me. Basically I sterilized the tools and I um, cut open his uh, skin which is very very thin uh, in front of the crop here and it's so thin um, I had to cut a bunch of feathers away so that you could see it. I started pulling them out and I thought that was too brutal. That was by far the worst part of this for him when I pulled out a feather. Um, so I just trimmed the feathers back so I could see and then um, cut the very thin skin just between some blood vessels and then the crop. Um, he did bleed. He lost, I'm going to say, about two or three milliliters of blood, um, which is, I think, okay. Uh, that didn't seem to be a huge problem. And then I spent a long time pulling out these hay pieces, some of which were over a foot long. And uh, yeah, it was it was a large bowl full of disgusting hay pieces. And then we sterilized him, sewed back up the crop and the, the skin there um, with, uh, with silk thread, which I had sterilized also. And the stitches and everything seemed to be healing just fine. However, he still has a bubble in his crop, so clearly he's still having some yeast problems. So now he's back on uh, having some anti-yeast diet with yogurt, probiotics, the vitamins, and uh, he's eating, but he's very, very weak. So he is currently our house chicken. Um, we hope we're still gonna be able to integrate him to the flock because although we adore him, we adore him partly because he's an excellent flock leader. So. Hopefully that still happens and that's where we're at right now. We're just trying desperately with a, a mixture of uh, scrambled eggs, 
uh, his own regular chicken mash, which is a, a grower mash that we're using, and um, uh, and yogurt. We're trying to help him build back his his strength. And we, we think we see some progress, but it's very, very slow. I hoped he would bounce back faster, but I guess when you've lost half your body weight in fat and muscles, it doesn't come back so easily. So that's a big one. I'm gonna return him to his home within our home and take you out into the garden to talk about some edible weeds. Yet more edible weeds, there are always more. And today we'll make a nice smoothie. The first of the plants that I'm going to gather for my smoothie is some plantain. Uh, now we have a few types around um, and I happen to have two growing right together here. So let me talk about those. This one, um, ignore these taller ones over here, but these short ones right in the front is called broad-leaved plantain. And it has these shorter little flower stalks that come up and the, the flowers, you can kind of see there are a few on there, but they're so tiny, they're not very obvious. And then they become seeds later on this stalk. And uh, the leaves are actually, hello, hello, I know. Um, the leaves are actually wonderful as a poultice um, for inflammation. They're, they're both types of plantain, and I should start by telling you right now, this is the narrow leaf plantain that, that's all along here and behind the, the broad leaved. So broad leaved and narrow leaved um, for obvious reasons. So um, they, they both have long uh, veins in them. Whoops, I tore that one. Uh, in fact, with the broad-leaved ones, sometimes when you pull the veins... Ooh, it's hard on this one. But sometimes the, you can actually wrinkle up the the leaf. They, they act like ligaments. Um, they both are anti-inflammatory, so you can chew either of them up um, and to use as a poultice on an insect bite or a rash, um, a scrape, anything that you're having a problem with, with inflammation, and internally as well. So. I'm sticking these in my smoothie. I'm going to wash them first. Um, but beyond that, um, I have a little interesting thing to show you. So I've brought this. Um, how do I explain this? Plantain is, um, the plantain family includes the the single type of plantain that is used to, to make psyllium husk. So if you use Metamucil or, or many other brand names of uh, dietary fiber, it is most likely, at least mostly, if not 100% psyllium husk. And you can also just buy psyllium husk um, in bags or powdered. Um, and in fact, the narrow leaf plantain is so closely related that once it goes to seed, as these are starting to, if you look at them, um, they sort of, this is the, the part that hasn't bloomed, and these little things sticking off here are the blossoms, and then they go to seed, and the part down below, so there's more of that on this one here, um, is the seeds. And then once they're dried and cured, you can actually put them in water, and they will gel up just like psyllium husk would, um, since they're almost the same thing. So if I look here, I'm going to find some that are quite gone to seed. This looks like a, a good candidate here. Come on. And I just brought this stick for stirring. Okay, it's been pouring rain, so these are actually quite, quite soggy. But when they're cured and dry, this actually works much better, but I'm going to see if I can make it work with these fresh green seeds. Come on, go on in. And yes, you can eat them just as you can psyllium husk. And just like with psyllium husk, if you eat too many, um, meaning, you know, a, a lot of it, a cup of, of dissolved psyllium or, or plantain seeds, um, you can actually cause blockages in your intestines because of, um, because of the swelling and the, the gel that sort of can impact them. 
interestingly, you would have an impacted gut just like our chicken. I didn't think to bring water here, so I'm going to go grab some and I will show you this in a moment. Okay, water. So now that we've made a green plantain seed sludge in here, I'm just gonna leave it to sit for a while while I make my smoothie and we'll have a look at it later. Because just like um, uh, psyllium husk, it needs to sit in order to expand. So, now for some smoothie leaves. When I was a kid, I lived on the other side of this island, and uh, sometimes we had to do the long, 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 arduous walk up from our property to, well, wherever we were going. I don't remember, I just remember the walk because it was excruciatingly long for a little kid. And along the way, there was ribwort growing, or long-leaf plantain, whatever you call it, narrow-leafed plantain. Um, and my mother and I named them the crowned prince and princess of Denmark, and we would go along looking for them. Don't ask me why, Denmark, why did we decide this? I don't know, but I still remember those walks and finding them along the road. So I'm getting a bunch of these because I have an inflammatory autoimmune condition and having plantain smoothies actually helps me. But I go for the younger leaves because the older ones especially later in the summer when all of them are older, um, they're, they're quite tough. And the younger leaves have more of the beneficial properties anyway. And I might as well throw in a few broad-leaved plantain while I'm at it. Also the younger leaves. You actually can eat all of these just as a, a cooked or a fresh plant, but they're quite tough. Remember those ribs I was telling about, so um, it's better not to. And because these are in quite pedestrian areas, and who knows where my cats walk, um, I'm going to wash them. Okay, on to the next plant. Over here we have some cleavers. And most people know this from their gardens. It's, it's a weed. Many people hate it. I don't hate it. I think it's fun. We used to call it stickweed when I was a kid. Um, because for obvious reasons, it sticks, not just the, the little tiny burrs that grow on the end, which are just beginning here, but also the, the stem and the leaves, they're all covered in these sort of hair-like um, prickles, I guess. I mean, they're not prickly, but yeah. And so they, they stick, they even stick to your hand, but we used to stick them to each other while we were hiking. So um, cleavers is a diuretic. Um, a rather mild one, but uh, it is healthy and edible, and I'm going to put some in my smoothie. You can eat all of it, and in fact, um, when you uh, eventually, uh, when these little burrs become brown and solid, you can harvest and eat them too. While I'm here, I'm not going to put this in my smoothie because I don't like the taste of it, but this over here behind a, a roto leaf is wall lettuce, which I know I spoke about a month or two ago, um, and you'll recognize these leaves. Um, this is what the flowers look like, and you can see it has some, some yellow flowers here, and many that either haven't opened or have already closed, and a couple have gone to seed. So that's what wall lettuce looks like when blooming but it's very bitter, so I'm not putting it in my smoothie. Let's go look at some lettuce that I will put in my smoothie. And this is the prickly lettuce. You can see that the leaves are similar to the wall lettuce we just looked at, but they, they look prickly. It's not actually prickly, although lettuce is related to thistles also. Um, and also similar to a dandelion, which 
I may have pulled all the dandelions from this garden. I don't know. This is my tomato bed, but I actually allow things like prickly lettuce and here's a quinoa. Whatever comes up, I allow it to grow as, as long as it's not actually causing problems for my tomatoes. So um, this is actually, being a lettuce, it contains, um, oh, what's the word? Narcotic, that's what I meant. Um, it has a little bit of a narcotic effect and um, it generally promotes a feeling of sleepiness or calm. So you wouldn't eat mountains of it, but I mean, who would anyway? Um, and it, it can be quite calming. So it's nice to add some to your smoothies. Um, I'll just put a few in. Now let's look for some, uh, well, buckwheat family. I'm going to do the whole family right now. Well, not the whole family, but a very, a bunch of, uh, a bunch of, uh, members of the buckwheat family. Who wants some sorrel? Yum, 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 yum. Here you go. So well, that's our, our roosters in the bachelor suite right now. Um, but here we have some sheep sorrel, which is one of the more common, um, varieties of well, buckwheat family that we have. Um, we used to call them sour grass because they taste so sour and lemony, which is what it's giving to this smoothie. Most of these things taste kind of bitter or just planty, leafy, but this is sour and delicious. So I'm going to gather quite a bit of it. And then I'll take you to look at some other members of the buckwheat family. I love sheep sorrel so much. So delicious. You might recognize by the shape of the leaf that it is also related to spinach. So spinach is also in the buckwheat family. Anyway, let's take these over to the other side of the house. One of the other most common members of the buckwheat family is dock. So this is western dock. Um, there's also curly dock people know about. Uh, which has these sort of twisty curly leaves and the leaves are quite bitter but edible we use them in a lot of things like casseroles and stir fries and mashed potatoes all kinds of things you just throw greens into anywhere you would put kale or spinach including salad but they are a little tougher and more bitter than you know your your average um, farm grown greens but i will put a couple in my smoothie and interestingly tell you that these seeds if you look at them closely you see they, they're all sort of little seeds that hang down and they are actually similar to buckwheat and in fact when you let them ripen as i'm trying to do here and i have a few plants around the yard i give them lots of space let them grow really tall and make all these seeds and when they ripen you can well leave them to dry and cure on the plant actually there's not much you have to do and then harvest them and grind them to make a flour which you can bake with just like you can bake with buckwheat i uh, am partly dutch and um, pannekoeken which are, are dutch pancakes are often made with buckwheat flour and uh, japanese also make soba noodles out of buckwheat flour there are lots of uses for buckwheat flour and this is quite similar and something we can find in the wild or in our gardens or in our the sidewalk outside your house <laughs> It grows everywhere and it's quite happy and easy to, well, not, it grows without doing anything. And I wanted to say while I'm here, although I don't have any blooming at the moment, rhubarb is also related to these. So if you've seen rhubarb ever bloom, it gets a huge stalk, but you know, these are, are a much narrower stalk, but it's a similar looking stalk and it gets kind of a, a head of flowers. Those are also related to the buckwheat family. although. In rhubarb's case, I'm not sure you can eat it. I've never heard that you could. Maybe you can. Someone will tell me, I'm sure. Um, and yeah, and as people know, although uh, rhubarb is in the same family, you don't eat the leaves. And the reason is they have so much oxalic acid that it's, it would poison you. You'd have to eat <laughs> bucket loads, I think, in order to die from that. But um, all of these plants, including spinach, have oxalic acid and you want to eat it in reasonable portions, like with anything in life. So that's it, let's go make the smoothie. 
So here I am with some water I brought just to wash this. Um, first the dock leaves, then our delicious sourgrass leaves, and oops, more sourgrass, some of that prickly lettuce, some cleavers, stick, 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 and the narrow-leaved plantain, or ribwort as some people say, and the broad-leaved plantain. So, now, I'm just going to give those a rinse, and we'll let them sit in there for a moment, although I'm pretty sure I picked them carefully, there are no insects or bird poop or all the other things you can have problems with in the wild. Oh, it reminds me to tell you, feeling all these sticky little burrs in here with, from the stickweed, which is now stuck to everything in here. Um, apparently, although I have never done this, uh, people can harvest the, uh, the little burrs once they're dry and roast them and use them as a coffee substitute. So that's interesting. But on to, for a moment, our pseudocilium husk. Ha ha ha. Couldn't help myself. So this is the uh, the seeds of the narrow-leaved plantain that I picked earlier and stuck in the water. And now they've been sitting here. I'm going to, I don't know if you'll be able to see this, but I'm going to pour them out on my hand. If I can get them out and see what they feel like. You can see they're clumping together. Yeah, I can feel the jelly a little bit. When they're dry, this would be much more slimy, but it's, uh, yeah, I don't know what to compare it to. It almost feels like if you had a little soap in the water, a little bit slimy. And just to show you that they're completely edible. Yeah, it's slimier in some places. So I think those that have matured a little more are creating more of the gelatinous fluid. I'll put some of them into my smoothie also. Maybe not all of them. I don't need that much fiber with all of these. So in my trusty old, slightly broken, but perfectly functional blender, I have just plain water. Um, and we're, we're on a well, a shallow well, so we don't have chlorine or anything. This is a great pure water. And uh, a little bit of lemon juice because I like that. Some people put honey in here. I do that for my kids. It makes it taste like lemonade. And if you want your kids to eat a green smoothie, that's the best way, in my opinion, because it's delicious. So there's that. And plug your ears. So that was deafening. Now to heal our eardrums. Let's have some green smoothie. Oh, it smells so good. This to me is like coffee. It's, well, no, coffee to me is terrible, but the, oh, what, I still have extra water in there. But this, it gives me so much energy, so much life, with or without honey. In fact, for me, maybe more without the honey. It's like a salad, but sweeter and just wonderful. Um, sometimes I put some herbs like lemon thyme, uh, but honestly, just like this, this is amazing. Happy exploring.